Welcome back to the show. Today, I'm titling this episode, Don't Be Stupid. I know that's a pretty painful title, isn't it? Don't Be Stupid. Well, I think you're not the only one, and I know I'm not the only one who has been stupid from time to time. And stupid takes on many forms, many definitions. And so I just want to jump into a considerable number of examples of how you and I can be tempted to be stupid, that is to allow our emotions in the middle or maybe at the beginning of a difficult time to rule what you're doing. Let me share a story. Automaker Henry Ford asked electrical genius Charlie Steinmetz to build the generators for his factory. One day the generators ground to a halt and the repairmen couldn't find the problem. So Ford called Steinmetz who tinkered with the machines for a few hours and then threw the switch. The generators whirled to life, but Ford got a bill for $10,000 from Steinmetz. Flabbergasted, the rather tight-fisted car maker inquired why the bill was so high. Steinmetz replied, well, for tinkering with the generators, $10. For knowing where to tinker, $9,900. So Ford paid the bill. There are times when being the loudest is not the way to impact people in your life. Again, there are times when being the loudest is not the way to impact people in your life. I've read a lot of books, a lot of articles about leaders who are not always the loudest in the room. And you say, well, you, know, you think about this leader and that leader and the military people of ancient times and of recent history, they seem to be the loudest. But you also think about a Steve Jobs and a Bill Gates and a bunch of other leaders and organizational heads who are not the loudest in the room, but they were able to get a lot done. I believe the majority of people meander through life without a clue about how to handle life struggles. And I would dare to say that even the most successful people struggle from time to time with life and what comes along their way to do certain things in their lives. In the Bible, there's, a, there's an ancient story in, in the book of Matthew chapter four. Let me, set, let me kind of set the scene for you. The, the story says that Jesus was born, obviously, and he was raised in a Jewish religion. And he, uh, at, in his youth, he hung around the Jewish teachers. So he learned from people that were smarter than him. So he, at least in one particular scene, that he wanted, he would rather have hung around the, the teachers than with his own family. So he grew up, he was growing up, and then he reached a point at age 30 when he felt that it was time for him to live his destiny, to do what he was chosen to do. So he, came to a situation in his life where he wanted to be baptized. And in that culture, there in this storyline, there was a guy named John who was baptizing people in a river. So John was Jesus's cousin. And there's a backstory behind that we're not, we're not gonna talk about right now. So Jesus walked to this place where John was baptizing people and John did not feel qualified to baptize Jesus because John knew who Jesus was, the Messiah, as some people call him or called him at the time. So John kind of bantered back and forth a little bit with Jesus that, you know, he's not qualified to do what he was doing for the other people, which was baptizing them. So eventually Jesus talked him into baptizing uh, Jesus also. And there was a scene there where several people came to the realization that Jesus was the chosen one, was the Messiah. Shortly after that, it says in Matthew chapter four, that Jesus was led, the, the, the text says, was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil or Satan or the evil one or whatever term you wanna put on it. So let me kind of jump into that storyline. And I'm in Matthew chapter four now, starting in verse two. It says, and after he had fasted or had not eaten 
for 40 days and 40 nights, it said that Jesus became hungry. So just stop and think about that for a second. If you had not eaten for 40 days, you would be hungry too. And you would have lost a considerable amount of weight, right? So you would be very, very weak, very, very frail. So it seems that, let's, let's kind of storyline here, verse three. So the tempter or Satan or the devil or whatever term you want to use, came to Jesus and said, if you are the son of God or the Messiah or the chosen one, command that these stones that were around him, these rocks, uh, become bread. But in verse four, it says, but Jesus answered and said, it's written, he's quoting from the Old Testament, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Another translation or paraphrase in the first part of this says, since you are the son of God. So let me just pause and back up momentarily about this text. It says that the tempter or the evil one came to Jesus after he had not eaten for 40 days. Now stop and think about that in your own life. Certainly you and I do not want to go 40 days without eating. We're going to end up in the hospital or dead. But it seems like some of the biggest temptations come to you and I when we are at our weakest moment. If you, think, if you just pause a minute and think about your own life, when you have been tempted to do things that you know is wrong, that you know you should not be doing or getting involved in or hanging around certain people or doing certain things, but it seems that those dark times, those tempting times come to you when you are the weakest. So there's, I think, a, a bigger story here than what's written in the scripture, maybe a life lesson for you, that if you want to be able to withstand some of the, the most difficult times in your life, then you need to be proactive in maintaining your strength in a variety of areas in your life. So again, the story continues in verse 5. It says, Then the devil took him into the holy city and, and had him stand on this very high place. And the evil one said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you. And then he said, then his, then his angels will pick you up and carry you so, so you won't even hurt yourself, my paraphrase. So Jesus responded. He says, on the other hand, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So stop it again. I want to pause multiple times here. But it seems that when the temptation came, Jesus looked back to what was already written. It seems like that happens sometimes, in fact, many times in legal proceedings, that when something comes up, they look back for something called precedence. They look back to see what has been done in the past or what has been written in the past in order to help them deal with what they're dealing with right then and there. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Now, I, I would let me insert just a little commentary here for just a minute. There are people that are going to want to get you to, um, to really do things that are not only immoral, but not unethical, and also compromise your self-worth. There have been people that I've had to work around over the last oh, 30 years or so that were immoral, they were unethical, and it seemed like they were getting ahead at the moment. But if you have the ability to fast forward several years, you're going to see time after time that the people who seem to be getting ahead at the moment, again, if you look forward in time, are the ones that always have to look over their shoulder because they know that they've taken advantage of so many people in their lives. I read Jesus' responses multiple times, and, and they were calculated and they were intentional. What, what's been one of my struggles for a long time is that I want to I want to respond when I'm attacked immediately. Jesus 
knew that he, re he really thought about how he was going to respond because he went back to what was already written. He went back to precedence. And for him, it helped him. So maybe for you to look back at what maybe other people have gone through, what other people have struggled with, and what they used to overcome those struggles can help you get through the struggles that maybe you're going through at the moment. The, the challenge to Jesus in this storyline was using the, the word if as a, as a challenge or a threat. That's kind of like what bullies do, don't they? They question, at least for us guys, they question our manhood. They question you know, our strength and our power and our intelligence. And there are people that you've maybe worked around, maybe in your own neighborhood, maybe in your own family, that want to challenge you and question who you are. But when you know your self-worth, those if questions, those challenges, those threats are going to run off your back. To us guys, you know, if somebody comes up to me and says, if you are so-and-so, the temptation is to prove who I am. Sometimes the temptation to prove who you are can get you in big trouble. How many times haven't you heard stories about college kids and frats or whatever groups that they have or, and they want to outdrink the next guy? Well, they end up dead because they end up poisoning themselves. And they end up doing things that aren't very smart because they're, they're giving into the if, they're giving into the, the challenge of that moment. Guys, generally speaking, don't like to be challenged. So why are you letting others with unethical intentions define you. Again, why are you letting others with unethical intentions define you? Why are you allowing other people that don't have your best interest at heart to manipulate your emotions? I was in a, uh, an office one time working. I was there for several years. And the leader of this office would have people um, do things to get them fired up. They would have them stand up, they'd have them yell, they'd have them do the wave and do all these, uh, these gyrations to get the room into a frenzy. Well, there was this one lady uh, who would not do it. She just sat there and knew what was going on. At the time, I was oblivious to the, to the, the mind games that this person was doing to a lot of us. There were probably 40 people in the room, in the office. But she would sit there and not uh, participate in this event because she knew what was going on. But the person in charge who was creating this frenzy that a lot of us were participating in, I have to admit, um, started to attack her and wanted her off of the team because he knew that she knew. And when you and I realize that there are, there's a percentage, thank goodness it's a small percentage of people that are trying to manipulate your emotions to do things that aren't very ethical and aren't, aren't very good for you, they're going to attempt to attack you. So the response should be, for both of us, is to go back through history and see what worked for other people instead of trying to, uh, to reinvent the, the wheel when we don't really have to. There are times when temptation comes to you to prove to others really who you are instead of waking up knowing who you are. Uh, I don't have to question my name's John because that's what my parents named me. If somebody called me Robert, I'm not going to respond because that's not my name. Or if they call me Mary, I'm certainly not going to respond. Or, or Jim. But my name's John, so I'm going to respond to John. Think about that a minute. There are people that are trying to to dance on that last nerve. Let me give you another story, another quick story. The older I get, the more I'm realizing that I have to be more careful who I allow into my circle. And some of the people that are in the circle of other people that you love, you can't have in your circle because they don't have your best interest at heart. Let me, let me kind of deep, dig a little deeper into that. There are family members that you have that have friends that don't need to be your friends. There are family members in your life that do certain things and have certain habits that you don't need in your own life. 
there are people in your workplace that do things and participate in activities that you don't need to be participating in. Now, the temptation for you is, and or for me, is to participate to be part of the crowd, to be part of the team, to be part of what's going on at the moment. When in fact, if you participate in those groups, then you're going to be eventually compromising who you really are. Let me share a quick story. In the Australian bush country grows a little plant called the sundew. It has a slender stem and a tiny round leaves fringed with hairs that glisten with bright drops of liquid as delicate as the fine dew. Woe to the insect, however, that dares to, stand, that dares to dance on it, although its attractive clusters of red, white, and pink blossoms are harmless. The leaves, though, are deadly. The shiny moisture of each leaf is sticky and will imprison, imprison any bug that touches it. As an insect struggles to free itself, the vibration causes the leaves to close tightly around it. The innocent looking plant then feeds on its victim. That story was from our Daily Bread back from 1992. There are people around you that don't have your best interest at heart. And some of those people you love, some of those people you care deeply about. But you and I have to realize that those people are not going to go where you need to go in your life. And parting ways with some of those people, for me, maybe for you, are painful because some of us want to take people with us on our journey. But there are some people who don't have the capacity to understand and be willing to pay the price to do what needs to be done in order to go where you're going. John Piper, he shares a story. He says that that's oftentimes that pe there are certain people who get their power by persuading other people to do stuff that's unethical. Let me share another story that kind of goes hand in hand with that. As the Union Pacific Railroad was being constructed, an elaborate trestle bridge was built across a large canyon in the west. Wanting to test the bridge, the builder loaded a train with enough extra cars and equipment to double its normal payload. The train was then driven to the middle of the bridge where it stayed for an entire day. One worker asked, are you trying to break this bridge? No, the builder replied, I'm trying to prove that the bridge won't break. In the same way, the temptations Jesus faced weren't designed to see if he would sin or, or, or break, but to prove that he couldn't. You know, I, I, most of you know who watch the shows, I go to the gym a lot, and there was a time, probably two years ago, maybe three years ago now, where I didn't believe that I could lift a certain amount of weight in a certain way. It was actually a bench press. I didn't think that I, I had the, the right size to be able to bench press a certain amount of weight. So I just look at these guys that were at the gym and they were benching all, all day long, exaggerating of course, but they, they, they would bench this weight that looked really easy. So one day my, my, my friend Chris Hardy and I were there at the same time and he says, are you gonna do bench press? I said, no, I can't do bench press. He says, why can't you do bench press? I said, well, it, I don't think I can do it. So he said, I don't understand why you think you can't do it. Now, I had been going to the gym for probably seven years at the time, by then, almost every day. He says, well, what do you mean you can't do it? He says, come, come on over here. So Chris, by the way, is, is six foot four, okay? Over 200 pounds. At that time, I was 5'10", about 175. So Chris had not only height on me, but I mean, he's a strong guy. So Chris kind of encouraged me in his kind way to get to the bench press and he loaded up the bench, the bar, and he told me to do it. Guess what happened? It was shocking. I lifted it. So all this time, all these years, I'm thinking because of what I thought was, I was smaller, I was not as, not bulky at all for that matter, uh, compared to the bodybuilders in the room, 
that I wasn't able to do. So I gave in to this mindset, to this, you can call it a temptation, that I wasn't good enough or strong enough to do. When in fact, all this time I had the ability to do it, but I just needed that little push. What I'm suggesting in the story is here that sometimes, I would say more times than not, that you and I need to surround ourselves with people that push us a little bit. That's kind of like what I'm hoping these shows do for you, is to give you a little push to do some things that maybe you had this mindset that other people could do it, that maybe you didn't even have the ability to do it, the talent to do it, the intelligence to do it, but in fact, you're as good as anybody else. In fact, shockingly, you may be better than everybody else in your own abilities. There, there's, there's also a, a, an ancient text in, in the scriptures over in, in Matthew chapter 10. And, and the paraphrased version of this says this in the New Testament of the Bible, Matthew chapter 10. It says, stay alert. This is hazardous work I'm assigning you. Listen, you're going to be like sheep running through a wolf pack. So don't call attention to yourself. Be as cunning as a snake and uh, as inoffensive as a dove. Inoffensive as a dove, but cunning as a snake. Do you know how kind of opposite that is? To be cunning as a snake, but inoffensive as a dove. What I'm suggesting to you is that you can't just walk through life blindly and assume that everything is just going to be laid out for you and everything's going to be perfect in every way. There are people around you that are not for your benefit. And again, I'm, I'm debating on whether to go down a certain path, but there are people in your life that you need to divorce yourself from that, let me say it this way, there are people that you need to divorce yourself from that will bring out of you very, very negative emotions that you don't want to bring out. Because once you start letting that stuff out consistently, it goes into your ears, because your ears are going to hear what you're going to say, and that goes into your mind and then creates a whole different mindset. So for me, what I've done is I've chosen to um, divorce myself from people. I don't allow certain people in my home. I don't allow certain people in my property. I don't even, I won't be in the same room with certain people because they bring out parts of me that I don't need to be brought out. And I'll say it in this way, that there are parts in you, and I'll even go as far as saying there's those dark parts in you that don't need to be brought out. So the wiser of us, if that's proper grammar, the wise of us choose not to hang around people that bring out the darkness in us, right? But the wise of us then, on the flip side, choose to hang around people and lessons like this and books that you should read and articles and material that bring out parts in us that we want to come out, that we want to develop, that we want to grow. At the gym, they have these trainers that go around helping people that pay for their services to train them to do certain exercises and this and that. Why? Because the trainers know what needs to be done. So I'm kind of, I guess I cheat a little bit, unfortunately, but I watch and learn while they're teaching other people how to do certain things. And I, I, I love the Star Wars films. Uh, I've seen them all, almost all of them now. And the Jedi Masters, the teachers, the instructors, the, the, the wise of the wise will uh, teach the people that they feel are qualified to master their skill sets. And then there's certain scenes where the teachers were kind of encouraging some of the um, students, I'll put it that way, that they shouldn't hang around certain people and do certain things because once again, it brings out that side that we all have. I mean, I'm not saying something out of class here. I mean, we all have those areas in our lives and, and in our beings that we don't want to let out of the bag because it's, it's, it's not positive, you know, anger or frustration or, or a temptation or two or negativity. We all have it. I'm no different than you, right? So if you want to walk with the wise, 
then you need to maybe look back at what has worked for the wise, leverage the tools that they've already written, and I go back to, you need to read a lot more than what you do. If you're not a reader, please become a reader every single day, or at least every other day. Get into the habit of reading material and stand on their shoulders because they've paid whoever they are. They've paid a price that you don't need to pay. All you got to do is read their material and, and model some of the things that they've done. So I'm hoping the show here today is going to give you an idea or two or a story that's going to help you develop in areas of your own life that can help you blossom in ways that maybe you haven't thought that you could blossom in. So when you're tempted to do things that you know you shouldn't do, look back at what's worked in the past. Think back and remember that you can respond in a way that's not emotional all the time, but it can be logical where you can stand your ground and do the right thing every single day. My name is John Carver. Thanks for watching and we'll be back real soon.